Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our Cornerstone Church of Boston Sunday worship service. Uh, my name is Pastor Danny, and I have the great privilege of leading us through some singing of songs of praise today. Uh, but before we get to singing, um, I'd like to read a short passage of scripture for us first. And this passage comes from Romans 8, uh, verses 31 through 39. Hear God's word. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him give graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died, more than that who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Last week, our brother Chris uh, asked us some questions about the guilt that we might feel about being a quote-unquote bad Christian. And maybe this week you felt that way. Maybe you feel that way right now. Maybe you didn't think about the sermon <laughs> since a week ago. Maybe your Bible is still collecting dust. Maybe you haven't done anything to think of God or to pray, or you haven't been mindful of others or worshipful this week, and you feel guilty, like you don't, like God must be upset at you. This passage reminds us that those things that we kind of circle in our heads are just so completely untrue. They're false. They're lies. Our conduct does not determine God's love for you. It's Jesus's righteousness and his work on the cross that does. Even as we read here, he, Paul mentions all these really great things, and at the end of this passage, he wraps it up saying, none of these things will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So I'd love for us to begin our service by being reminded of that, that whether you feel good with God or guilty, that it's not your good deeds. Maybe you are excellent at being worshipful this week. That doesn't actually make any difference in God's love for you either. It's not our good deeds, nor our bad, nor our apathy, or our absence of any deeds at all that dictates God's love for you. It's all in the work of Christ Jesus. So I'd like to begin this service by just silently either listening or praying for a moment, and then we'll sing a song uh, called Here is Love that I hope will be an extension of that prayer and we'll cement this truth inside of our hearts as we begin. So let's uh, just take a moment of silence and we'll begin. So I'm about to break um, one of the cardinal rules of worship leading, and that is to uh, sing a song that is horrendously out of your key. And the reason why I'm going to do that is because I know that since we started this um, online stream, and it's been a few months now, we've had only male worship leaders, which has made singing quite difficult for our sisters. Um, don't worry, I've been aware of that, and some of you have told me, but uh, the worship core has been aware of that since day one, and we are working on it, I promise. We are trying to get 
um, equipment to our sisters and we have uh, some Sundays coming up where our sisters will finally be leading us in singing. Uh, so, so we know, don't worry. And so because I love you sisters and because I want you to engage and sing along with us, I'm going to sing half of our set this Sunday uh, in, a, in a key that's going to make me sound like an ogre, um, but it's going to be worth it. And so, uh, yeah, let's all sing together regardless of whether it's too high or too low or you don't know the song or you do. Um, let's sing and join our voices together in unison. And for this song, again, I hope that it uh, cements the truth of God's love for you in Christ Jesus our Lord. So let's sing this together. Here is love, vast as the ocean, loving kindness as a flood. When the Prince of Life, our ransom, shed for us his precious blood. Who his love will not remember, who can cease to sing his praise. He can never be forgotten through our heaven's eternal day. Sing on the mount, on the mount of crucifixion, fountains open deep and wide through the flood of your mercy for a vast and gracious sign. Here is love like mighty rivers poured unceasing from above. Heaven's peace and perfect justice gives the guilty world Let me all. Let me all thy love accepting, love thee ever all my days. Let me seek thy kingdom only, and my life to be thy praise. Thou alone shall be my glory. Nothing in this world. Thou hast cleansed and sanctified me, Thou Thyself hast set me free.
to know our Savior. The mercy of our God. The cross and leaves no question of the measure of His love. Our chains are gone, our debt is paid. Cross has overthrown the grave for Jesus' blood that sets us free means death to death and life for me. The innocent judge guilty while the guilty one walks. Death will be his portion And our portion liberty Our chains are gone Our debt is paid The cross has overthrown the grave For Jesus' blood that sets us free means death to death and life for me. I give my whole life to honor this love. By the Lamb who was slain, I'm forgiven. The sinner Savior, crown him forever. For the Lamb who was slain, He is risen. I give my whole life to honor this love. By the Lamb who was slain. Forgiven the sinner Savior, crown him forever. For the Lamb who was slain, he is risen. I give my whole life to honor this love. By the Lamb who was slain, I'm forgiven. The sinner Savior, crown him forever. For the Lamb who was slain, he is risen. Our chains are gone, our debt is paid. The cross has overthrown the grave for Jesus. Jesus' blood that sets us free means death to death and life for me means death to death and life for me means death to death and life for me Make this commitment one more time. I give my whole life. I give my whole life to honor this love. By the Lamb who was slain, I'm forgiven. The sinner Savior, crown him forever. For the Lamb who was slain. He is risen. Lord Jesus, thank you for your work on the cross and for your love for us. Thank you that we know this to be true, that nothing can separate us from the love of God through Christ Jesus our Lord. We praise you and we give this service to you as our offering. But we also give our lives to you, Lord, as our offering. And we make this commitment to give our whole lives to honor this love by the Lamb. 
So Jesus, be praised in our lives, be adored, be lifted higher and higher. Would nothing take the seat of the throne in our hearts, Lord, but you. We push out and declare all these other idols, Lord, are meaningless and deserve to be pushed out of our lives. And then only you shall reign inside of our hearts, Lord. So Jesus, we lift you high and we give you thanks for everything that we have is from you and for you. Be with us as we hear the announcements, as we partake in offering and listening of the word and responding to your word and all these things in our service today. We pray that it will be, we pray that it will be pleasing in your sight and that it will be our offering that we give to you and that you would make it holy. We pray all these things in your precious name. Good morning, Cornerstone. Thank you for taking time out of your weekend to worship with us. For myself, I need these Sunday mornings to connect, even virtually, with as many of you as possible, to sing the same songs together, to sit under the Word of God together as one church family. I know for me, without this time, the days and weeks would blur together even more than they already have been. So even if you're not the type of person to do so, we ask that you would engage us on the chat, let us know your name, where you're worshiping from at some point throughout this service. We have a lot of exciting and meaningful opportunities coming up, uh, and we have something for every single person at our church to engage in over the next few weeks. Uh, any of the announcements that I'll be sharing, all of the details can be found in our weekly e-news, so make sure you're subscribed. The first announcement is for our summer community groups. Summer community groups will begin next week, so Sign up by tomorrow to make sure you're placed into a group in advance and that you get all the information you need for your first gathering. Uh, this summer, uh, community groups will focus on how believers should engage with politics, especially as we look ahead at the 2020 elections here in the United States. We are also in need of leaders to help lead these groups uh, so please, please, if you are available, if you're willing to help us provide enough groups for everyone who's interested, uh, let us know as you uh, go to the sign-up form. The next announcement is for our work-life prayer meeting on June 3rd. Uh, at 8.30 on, on June 3rd, join Pastor Bill as he leads a, just a 30-minute prayer meeting before your workday, um, especially as so many of us are not working uh, in our offices, we don't have to commute anymore, but we're working from home. So even if you're not working on that particular day, uh, we invite you to participate to get a sense of how your faith in Jesus and your vocation go hand in hand. Next, we have our Family Ministry Talent and Trivia Night on June 6th. So this upcoming Saturday, uh, Pastor Linda is hosting a talent night for the children of our church. Kids can showcase uh, maybe a song that they know how to sing or a song that they know how to dance to, how high they can jump, uh, any jokes that they can tell. So all you moms and dads, start preparing your children. Um, and then after the children have their time of fun, there will be a trivia night for all the husbands and wives at Cornerstone. Um, Pastor Linda asks that uh, everyone RSVPs using Cornerstone Connect using the link on the screen the next opportunity uh, that we have is uh, related to our sermon series the past couple of weeks. We've heard that uh, as a church, we want to find ways to be oriented towards others during this time, even during a pandemic. And we have this unique opportunity to serve grade school students in the city of Boston, uh, specifically the families that are financially strained at the Neighborhood House Charter School. Uh, the Love Mercy Do Justice team is looking for volunteers to create care packages of canned goods, snacks for children, hygiene products, and uh, even PPE. If you're interested in helping provide these care packages, please fill out the form on Cornerstone Connect and the LMDJ core team will reach out to you and coordinate details for pickup of these care packages. So it's a great opportunity for us to be missional, to love our city. Uh, so please consider uh, participating in that. At Cornerstone, one of the sweetest parts of our times of worship together have been 
uh, has been partaking in communion as a church family. And the pastors wanted to share in advance that we will partake in communion in our live stream service next Sunday. In order for us to do this well, we need everyone to prepare their own communion elements, the bread and the cup in advance. Details around how you should prepare your heart, uh, your home, and the communion elements will be um, sent out through our e-news. So please read through the entire communication uh, around that so that all together uh, we would have such a sweet and life-giving time with God next Sunday. As all of us have most likely been exposed to, um, it has been a devastating and heartbreaking stretch of, of about a month over the recent loss of black lives of Ahmad Arbery, Breonna Taylor, and George Floyd, who are just three individuals in a long and dark history of racial injustice against black and African Americans in this country. The pastors at Cornerstone want to make it clear that silence is not an option for us as, as believers of Jesus Christ. We want to respond in a godly and biblical, biblical way. So today, from 12.30 to 1 p.m., we want to provide a space to seek the Lord in lament over Zoom during this painful time for our Black sisters and brothers. So jot this link down or look for the email that went out on Friday morning through our e-news. And we just want to a lot, uh, uh, just uh, set aside time um, to, to lean in to God, lean in to one another. So please, if you're interested, make sure um, you join us uh, shortly after service today. Now we will go into a time of worshiping, worshiping through the giving of our tithes and offerings at Cornerstone. Uh, we believe that our finances are a gift from God and by being generous to your local church, you are helping further God's purposes in the world. Uh, your giving helps us continue to find ways to bless our city and our world. So thank you to everyone who has continued to give faithfully. Uh, we invite anyone who worships with us regularly to start recurring giving at any point. It's as simple as sending a text using the directions on the screen. So as I give you time uh, to give your tithes and offerings, our leadership team wanted to share a quick message with you all. So take a look at uh, this video that they've prepared for you. Hi, Cornerstone. Happy Sunday. My name is Eugenia. And my name is Abe. And as we are part of the leadership team here at Cornerstone, which also include Jennifer Chung, Minnie Kim, Andrew Lee, and Pastor Bill. On behalf of our leadership team, we just wanted to share a short message with you all. In the midst of this pandemic, we have been praying for you that you're each staying safe and healthy and thriving in quarantine as the pastors have been preaching. We also wanted to show our faces as a way to invite you to engage with us. In this time of uncertainty, you may have questions and concerns to share with leadership, and we definitely want to hear from you. So please reach out to us via LT email, which we'll leave in the live chat. We also just want to let you know as a leadership team that we are doing our best to pray, discern, and discuss through the multiple scenarios uh, on the future of our church through these uncertain times. We are weighing all our options, and so please know that we're doing whatever we can with the information that we have. Although you've been getting all those countless emails uh, from corporate, uh, different corporations saying the same thing, we truly mean it when we say that the safety and well-being of our congregation is our top priority. We also want to thank you for joining us online and for your commitment to Cornerstone. We've been so blessed seeing all of you gather virtually and practice what it means to be a Christ-centered community, to check in and care for one another despite the social distancing. We're actually monitoring an increase in intentional engagement, and we're really encouraged by that and hope that you are as well. Um, if you're feeling isolated in any way, please reach out to us again using the LT email. And as one final encouragement, we just want to uh, say that as we continue to navigate through this pandemic, we just want uh, to know, let everyone know that there's no such thing as quote unquote winning uh, quarantine and that we're doing our best at, with what we have. Productivity means something completely different today than it used to before. We will get through this time together and that our amazing community is here for anyone who needs it. We love you, Cornerstone. Stay safe. Bye. Bye. 
Thank you, leadership team. Would you join me as I lift up a prayer for the rest of our time together? Father, we thank you for the opportunity and even the technology to connect in this way. We don't take it for granted that uh, even in this limited way, we are able to be united to you and be united to one another. And God, we do ache and, and long for the day when we can be physically with one another. We can see each other face to face. We can, yeah, we can give handshakes and hugs and high fives, and we can look at look in, look each other in the eye, and be so thankful to you to to one another of the gift of corporate worship. But at the same time, we believe that you can still work and you can do everything we need within us and through us so that people would know who you are, people would be able to respond to you. And us too, God, during this time of worship, we want to respond to you. We want to obey you. We want to trust you in ways that we have not ever been able to do. We believe that you can transform our hearts through this time. So we pray as uh, we have worshiped through song and even through the giving of our tithes and offerings, that this is just, just one part of our, of our worship to you, God. This is just, just a sign of a life fully devoted to you, God. So as we submit ourselves to the Word of God, as we place ourselves under the authority of your Holy Word, your your precious life-giving word. We want you to do whatever's necessary so that we would see you a little bit clearer, that we will love you a little bit more, and that we will love our neighbors uh, more wholeheartedly. So bless us so that we can be a blessing. We love you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you again for worshiping with us. I hope you will be thoroughly blessed by the preaching of God's word by our pastor, Linda. Good morning. I'm Pastor Linda, one of the pastors here at Cornerstone, and I add my welcome to the rest you've already heard. No matter where you are, where you, when you watch this, it's a joy to be together in community, isn't it, and worship. Today marks the last sermon in our series on Thrive. And if you missed any along the way, they're on our YouTube station and they're on our live stream on our website. What a journey it's been as we've learned about thriving in our soul and worship in the world and holiness, and that brings us to today. How to thrive in community. What I have now titled, Community Overflowing. It's our focus for today, but as we head into the topic, we're gonna need some guidance from the Holy Spirit. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you on this Sunday time and worship together. It is a privilege to be able to come together and sing and pray and learn and just be together in this way. Holy Spirit, I pray that you enter into each home represented here and each person as they are here gathered in community to be with you and each other. Be present, Lord Jesus. Amen. So I'm coming to you today from the community room in the new building we've just moved into. It's a lovely space. The deck is out there with the grill. It's gonna be really fun to have you over some time. But it's not a very big room, so we can't have all of you at once. But today, you're all here together. All of you, look at the number on where, how you're watching. Look on how many people are watching on YouTube. Look at how many people are on our live stream. What a lot of people we are together. And so you know what? It's great that community is community no matter where we are. Now, if you haven't done it already, put in where you are worshiping from, how spread out our community is, and yet we are united. And while you finish that up, let me give you the official Merriam-Webster Dictionary online of community. It's a social group of any size whose members reside in a specific locality, share government, and often have a common cultural and historical heritage. I think that definition of community talks about a neighborhood, a city, a town, even a country. Now the second definition they have for community is much more about us. And that is a social, religious, occupational, or other group sharing common characteristics or interest and perceived or perceiving itself as distinct 
in some respect from the larger society within which it exists. That's us, a religious group sharing common characteristics of interests and beliefs perceiving itself to be distinct. And I pray that others see us as distinct also. Now what's amazing is I got to see a little peek into this type of community this past week. An experience that never would have experienced a few months ago. I was invited to share a devotion at my sister Donna's church that's just outside of Toronto, Canada. Each spring, they have a spring fling, a yearly gathering and, uh, and celebration, and it's for their seniors. This year was different. Their spring fling was over Zoom, so I was able to attend. Now, these are people aged 60 to 99. Yes, I said 99, and he was sitting on the couch beside his young little 97-year-old wife. Could you imagine? They never could have imagined having spring fling over the computer. The world they were born into, think about this, the roaring 20s, the dirty 30s, the war-filled 40s, the Cold War 50s, did not prepare them for the technology and how community gathers right now. Through all of their history, community has been and continues to be community even though how it is done has changed. Well, they started off on the back porch and then there were telegrams and letters, phone calls, evolved to emails, and now Zoom changes. The sense of community and love I witnessed by this group was inspiring and it just overflowed over the internet. Even though the years brought an unimaginable number of changes to how their communities were lived out with technology, their community has stayed true to who they are under God, living this out together, and they are a community overflowing through it all. As these people are thriving in community, so can we. Our foundational scripture today is from Psalm 133. Three short verses that speak volumes of what our community is, what it calls us to be, and its effect on us. Psalm 133. How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. It is like precious oil poured on the head, running down the beard, running down Aaron's beard, down on the collar of his robe, as if it were the dew of Hermon with, were falling on the Mount Zion. For there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life evermore. Scholars have noted that the beginning and the ending sentence form one thought, and then in between are two similes. The thought is how good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. For there the Lord bestows his blessings, even life evermore. Now that is thriving, isn't it? Good, pleasant, unity, blessing, and life everlasting. I believe the two similes in the middle guide us to learn how to be that community overflowing. You see, God created us to be in community, to be in unity, didn't he? Way back in creation recorded in Genesis, it said, God said, let us create them in our image, in the image of the Trinity, in community, in unity with each other. God said it was not right for Adam to be alone. He knew he had created him in his image to be in community. And though the relationship with God was perfect, added needed community that were humans also. Our psalmist goes on. It is like precious oil poured on the head, running down the beard, running down Aaron's beard, down on the collar of his robe. Now I believe anointing in scripture is represented for two main purposes that we'll work through, though there are even more. And I've got some of my anointing oil here to show you. I got it in Israel. The first is to be anointed as a priest. Anointing with oil has been around for thousands of years. And as this verse refers to, this oil for Aaron was to anoint him as a priest, marking a priest set aside for God's service. We see this happening to Aaron in Leviticus. For us as believers in Jesus Christ, we are all anointed, all of us. And we enter into what is called the priesthood of all believers. The apostle Peter writes about it in his first epistle. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, 
a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Each of you, as a believer, has been anointed to live out Jesus Christ. You have been anointed into the call to declare the praises of God and to live life as Jesus showed us and still teaches us today. Somehow this is appropriate. Today is Sunday, Pentecost Sunday. Set aside to remember what happened to those first disciples when the Holy Spirit came. Now I, I want you to hear these words that are recorded about Pentecost. It was their anointing of their calling to live out Jesus Christ. I'd actually like you to just sit. Close your eyes if you wish. Palms up to receive and hear this anointing coming to you. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each one of them, each one of you. All of them were filled. Each of you are filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. This is foundational to having a community overflowing, knowing you are anointed, you are filled by the Holy Spirit, and you are a child of God. Now, I was physically anointed with oil like this when I was ordained, my specific calling. And it was incredible outpouring of God into my life and the Holy Spirit into my ministry. At my last church, every couple of years, we actually anointed people for their specific callings, where they worked, at home, at school. Every person has a specific calling. Now that's different than the calling I just talked about because that is a calling that all believers in Jesus Christ have. Call out to live out Christ every moment of every day. So you're anointed to be a priest for each other and that is to be the presence of God to each other and bring others into the presence of God. Now there's a full sermon series on those two points. So I'm just gonna to touch on them quickly. But first we are to be the presence of God for others. I love and highly recommend the book by Bonhoeffer that's called Life Together, the classic exploration of Christian community. I'll put up a picture of it at the end. Short, clear, and challenging. And he has so many teachings of how we can live this out what an important ministry we are to each other. I'm gonna share just a couple of things he says. This is not extensive in all of it, um, but I think these are some key ones as we're learning how to thrive, how to live out community overflowing in the situation we're in right now. One thing he says, we have to live the ministry of holding one's tongue. Yeah, you heard that right. The ministry of holding one's tongue. Now, sometimes in scripture, God is silent, isn't he? And that was when humans needed to share and be heard before anything else could happen and change. We live in a society right now that encourages us to voice our opinion all the time, step in, tell everyone what they have to do, and we don't listen very well. When we're with people, we make snap judgments all about them, and we're ready to jump in. Being human, our thoughts about others are sometimes well, let's just say not so holy. The ministry of holding one's tongue, Bonhoeffer says, it helps because often we can combat our evil thoughts effectively if we absolutely refuse to allow them to be expressed in words. Like Ephesians 4, 29 says, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may be beneficial, benefit those who listen. We are the presence of God to each other when we live out the ministry of holding one's tongue, stop the unwholesome talk coming out of our mouths. When we can patiently let the other person talk, as Bonhoeffer puts it, we begin to realize 
that God did not make this person as I would have made him. He did not give me a brother or sister for me to dominate and control, but in order that I might find above him, the creator, created in God's image, not image of what we think they should be or we think our relationship to be. Closely tied to the ministry of holding our tongue is the ministry of listening. Bonhoeffer says, just as love for God begins by listening to his word, so the beginning of love for our brethren is learning to listen to them. We forget that listening can be a greater service than speaking. Now Jesus did this, didn't he? Think of all the times he listened to people for what they needed, what they wanted to talk about. And even when he asked the question, he listened to their answers gently. He didn't listen with what Bonhoeffer describes as half an ear. And he describes it as this. And uh, unfortunately, I see myself in this a bit, occasionally. It's an impatient, intentive listening that despises the brother or sister and is only waiting for a chance to speak out and then just get rid of this person. That is harsh. That's listening with half an ear. That's not a godly presence listening. To bring the presence of God to others as an anointed priest, we have to listen with full ears. Along with the ministry of holding our tongue, ministry of listening, one other ministry Bonhoeffer expounds here, and there's more, but this one's important to us, and that's the ministry of bearing, he calls it. It comes from the one another's of the New Testament, if you've ever heard that term. Jesus teaches, the disciples, the apostles teach in their letters, that there are one another's of how we are to treat each other. Now, most scholars have it at 56 or 59, some say 40, because they don't take repeats. Anyways, some of them are to be devoted to each other, to live in harmony with one another, share with one another, carry one another's burdens, forgive one another, love one another, confess your sins with one another, and more. Bonhoeffer has a great description of what bearing one another, the ministry of bearing, in community overflowing should be. To bear the burden of another person means involvement with the created reality of the other. To accept and affirm it, and in bearing with it, break through to the point where they take joy in it. Note what it doesn't say. It doesn't say to bear the burden of another is to fix it. A community overflowing walks with each other, journeys with each other, enters into each other's pain and joy and dwells there with each other. This is living one another when a community is overflowing. So being the presence of God with each other, with the ministry of holding our tongues, the ministry of really listening and bearing each other's burdens, this is the first aspect of being anointed into the priesthood of all believers, being the presence of God with each other. Now second, we are anointed to bring others into the presence of God. And it's only when we as a community include all of the aspects we just talked about, only then can we approach being a priest, bringing others into the presence of God and enter into what Bonhoeffer says is the ministry of proclaiming. Too often that's where we start, isn't it? We jump into preaching, quoting scripture, telling people what to do, telling, saying, God told me to tell you this, without first bringing God's presence to them, and then we can bring them into God's presence. As Bonhoeffer puts it, we speak to one another on the basis of the help we both need. We admonish one another to go the way that Christ bids us to go. We warn one another against the disobedience that is our common destruction. The humble person will stick to truth and love. Truth and love. That is the ministry of proclaiming, bringing others into the presence of God. As the author of Hebrews wrote, and let us consider how we may spur one another toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, 
and all the more as you see the day coming. We encourage each other to keep meeting in the presence of God. We encourage each other towards love and action that comes from community overflowing. This sums up community overflowing well, drawing others into God's presence. So that's the anointing properties of oil into the priesthood of all believers, that we bring the presence of God into others and we bring others into the presence of God. But there is another property of anointing in scripture and that is healing. And there's many, many examples of this throughout Old and New Testament. When Jesus sent out the 12 disciples in Mark chapter six, it says they drove out many demons and anointed many sick with oil and healed them. James refers to that if any are ill, you should call the elders of the church to pray over them, anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And in the parable of the Good Samaritan that Jesus gives us in Luke, Jesus describes the Good Samaritan as having compassion on the beaten Levite, picking him up, bandaging his wounds, and pouring on oil and wine, healing. Another wonderful example of this is from Mark 2. As John Ortberg calls this the fellowship of the mat. I love that. It's four friends in a community that's overflowing, bringing their paralyzed friend to Jesus for healing. It's a great story because they can't get in the door. So what do they do? They go up to the roof, tear it open, and bring their friend into Jesus' presence. And I love how John Ortberg put, puts this. He says, you cannot carry someone's mat in a hurry. The requirement of true intimacy is time. Healing takes time. It takes our commitment. And that's one thing we all have is time. We have been anointed as priests to live in a community overflowing and to bring healings to other. We have the time for this. Who do you know that needs healing? And what can you do as an anointed priest to bring them into God's presence for that healing. What about you? What areas of life do you need healing in? Who can you reach out to in our community overflowing to bring you to Jesus for healing? We have the time. We're here. We are anointed priests bringing the presence of God into others and bringing others into the presence of God. We bring them to the healing Jesus Christ can work in their lives. One other note from this verse is just the abundance of overflowing. Our anointing isn't just a little dab here, a little dab there, but it says our anointing to the priesthood of believers create a community of overflowing. It pours down. It pours all over us. It radiates out from us. It pours out of each one of us. It touches everyone around us. That's anointing. That's community overflowing. As it says in Psalm 23, you God anoint my head and my cup overflows. God our shepherd anoints us. Our cup overflows. This also makes it a little messy, doesn't it? However, community is messy, especially authentic ones that try to live out Jesus Christ together, being the presence of God to others and bringing others into the presence of God. Being a part of community overflowing involves being human with each other, journeying with each other, and because we are human and sin still creeps in, it gets messy sometimes. I believe the psalmist of Psalm 133 knew that, and I know God knows that. And so the psalmist brought into the next verse what, what else the community overflowing is. He says, it is as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion. See, Israel is a very parched land, and the dew of Hermon in the north would accumulate and eventually flow down and nourish and refresh the land. When we live in community overflowing, we are refreshed and we bring refreshment to others despite the messy times. And in Psalm 133, it's all about movement. You see, it's one of the Psalms of Ascent, which means the people would say these communally as they walked up to Jerusalem 
yes, Jerusalem's on the top of the hill in the middle of Israel. So their people are moving up. And in the Psalm, the oil is coming down, the water is coming down, everything's moving all around them. And that's community overflowing. It moves, it changes, it surrounds us, and it sustains us. Community overflowing is moving, it's not static. It's not unchanging. God doesn't change. But how we live out community overflowing may look different from time to time. So I wrap up this in our community room in our building, bringing you back to the community I spent time with this week. The one I met over Zoom, those people who had been anointed as a priesthood of all believers, as healers, and they allowed their community overflowing to be present over the computer because of who God is. No change in technology changes who we are as brothers and sisters or how our anointing flows from us to all around us. As believers, we are not like any other community. We are the family of God. We are anointed to be the community overflowing, the priesthood of all believers, bringing God to each other and each other into God's presence, bringing healing, for which it shall be said how good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. For there the Lord bestows his blessing and even life evermore. Let us pray. Father, we are still your gathered people. We're not in the same room, but we are gathered together, anointed as your priests. Continue to give us the strength to live that out. Continue to give us wisdom and creativity of how to have our community overflow because you know that you have poured your abundance into us. Thank you, Lord Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Linda, for sharing God's word with us today. Um, church, let's uh, close up our service by responding in two songs of praise. You thought of us before when the world began to breathe. You knew our names before we On the very day we fall away from you, how desperately we need to be redeemed. Lord Jesus, come lead us. We're desperate for your touch.
comes to community, um, you know, communities cannot thrive without unity. And one of the things that can, that, that are necessary, that we must have in community in order to thrive, in order to have any unity at all, is for us to also have humility. And the one thing that we could never stand boldly and with proud is to stand before God and to say that we are greater than Him. And worshiping and joining our voices and singing a song like this is what brings us all together. And so let's all, uh, in our hearts, lay down our crowns before the feet of Jesus. Let's humble ourselves before Him. Let's put down our pride. 
And let's together join our voices and our hearts in singing holy, 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 lifting up Jesus together. Lord God, unite us now. Unite us in singing. Unite us in our spirits and our hearts and our humility before you and allow our community to, thr- to, to thrive greater than ever before. We sing this together. Thank you again for joining us in worship. Our prayer is that you are blessed by the presence of God, challenged by his word, and encouraged by the community overflowing we are called, even anointed, to be a part of. God is good. God is present. Remember communion next week. Look for our e-news with a devotional and also instructions coming out tomorrow on Monday. Sign up for e-news if you haven't yet at cornerstoneboston.org so that you are able to receive these. Remember our time of corporate lament at 1230 today, where as a community, we want to overflow into bearing the burdens with others. This is the book I mentioned earlier, Life Together by Dietrich Bonhoeffer. So I do encourage you to look it up. Hey, and if you want to have a book club studying it, email me. But as we head out, let us head out, let us head up like the Israelites did. And may we go out with God's blessing and this benediction. Let us pray. Father God, you have anointed us to overflowing. You have created us to be a priesthood of believers anointed to bring the presence of God to others and others into the presence of God. You've anointed us to bring healing and to bring others to you for healing. Holy Spirit, help us to hold our tongues, listen completely, and enter in and bear each other's burdens. And when those are authentic, into the ministry of proclaiming. Release us from our static image of what community is and guide us to step into community overflowing, overflowing with your truth and love. You lead us beside the still waters. You anoint us with oil and our cups overflow. And we are eternally grateful. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a great week, everybody.